February is the first day. Thank you, Natalie, for recording us. Today is the first day of Lunar New Year, an international holiday that is celebrated by about a billion and a half people throughout the world, primarily people from China, Korea, and Vietnam. And this is the year of the tiger succeeding the year of the rat. I'm happy to be done with the year of the rat. I don't know about you. The tiger is commonly associated with bravery, courage, and strength. And I'm wearing red in, in celebration of the Lunar New Year. Now, Sarah Laughlin is giving today's reflection. Um, I expect knowing Sarah that she's going to be talking about a different annual celebration, just a hunch. Sarah, over to you. Why, yes, I am, because in addition to the Year of the Tiger, it's also Groundhog's Day Eve, and I'm here with my, my little friend um, to wish you all a happy Groundhog's Day. Um, I've been celebrating Groundhog's Day for, as it turns out, 31 years, my, or, or 30, this is my 31st year. The first Groundhog's Day card I sent was in 1992. And so over that period of 30 years, every year I've thought of some, some angle on Groundhog's Day. And it, it started out with being, it, has, it had to be something, it had to be from the viewpoint of the groundhog. Um, so what would this day be like? Or what, were, what would a groundhog be thinking as he woke up? So the first one, and, and this is in line with Sally's um, uh, reflection, was... Um, in 1994 was global groundhog greetings in six different languages. That was interesting. Some countries don't even have groundhogs. So finding the word for groundhog was a little difficult. Um, then there was the groundhog stomp um, with a, that, that was an ad for a, a full-size dance practice floor mat for your groundhog bureau. The, the genealogical Groundhog Day card where I discovered that in 1839, my Gar ancestors built the first threshing machine in Indiana called a groundhog. Um, the 1998 Muddy Truth newsletter, uh, the groundhog gravy recipe in 2000, the groundhog national anthem in 2003 and the Pledge of Allegiance in 2005, baby boomer groundhog day um, in which the type is very, very small. Um, Global Warming Groundhog Day, Groundhogs for Change in 2009, the Groundhog Census, of course, in 2010, um, and then, um, you know, the Palindrome Ground Groundhog Day on 02022020, and last year, of course, 2021 was Unmute Yourself. Um, so, this, so I, but I picked out the, the second Groundhog card um, as, as my favorite um, still today, so this is from 1993. I don't. The only one that I don't have a copy of is 2000. Is 1992. Who knew that I would be doing it ever again after that? But let me be the first to wish you a happy Groundhog's Day. May your burrows be warm, your teeth sharp, your fur dry, and may there be no shadows in your life. Happy Groundhog's Day, 2022. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, it wouldn't be February 2nd without the annual greeting from Sarah Laughlin for Groundhog's Day. But what's the groundhog going to say tomorrow? Do we know? Do we have a prediction? No, we'll have to wait and see. Okay. So I'll be um, introducing any guests that we might have today. Um, I saw Teresa Clare come aboard. Teresa, welcome. Um, we're happy to have you here. Um, guest of Jim Bright. And um, it's great to see Ron Jensen on the screen. Ron, welcome back. It's been too long since we've seen you. Not a visitor, but uh, a longtime Rotarian friend. Are there any other guests who I've missed on the screen? I think that's it. Okay. Um, I want to thank our producers today, Michael Shermus, Joy Harder, and Natalie Blaze. You see the four of us when you enter um, the meeting every week on Zoom. You can, you're welcome to either hang out with us, of course, on the homepage or go into your 
your roundtable groups, your breakout rooms, as you know. And let us know what you talk about. And if you like the, the continuing um, conversations that you've got in your breakout groups. Um, thanks also to Kyla Cox Deckard, who is our roundabout reporter this week. We have a couple of birthdays this week. Cynthia Needhart is, has a birthday tomorrow on Groundhog's Day. What a great day to have a birthday. And Bill Murphy, happy birthday on February 7th. And we have some significant member anniversaries this year. So first of all, Aaron Brewington, who is the primary rep for Smithville, has been a member of our club for only one year. Aaron, you've been active. It's been great to have you aboard. Yay, Aaron. And then we've got a, a pair of anniversaries. One is Aaron Davis, nine years as a member of Bloomington Rotary. And then there's Martha Foster, nine years with our club. I do believe they joined the same day. Plus three years with the club in, I believe it was Evanston. Correct me if I'm wrong. Martha did some work with Rotary International before she and Aaron came down to Bloomington. And we're so happy to have you in our family. We have a few announcements today from your fellow Bloomington Rotarians. I'm gonna start with an announcement from Tim Jessen. Tim, take it away. V. Gates, Gerhard, and Ron. Uh, I'm talking to all of you that know uh, high school students, your children, grandchildren. We are having the annual speech contest again this year. So far, we have no applicants. We've appealed to uh, speech teachers in the uh, public high schools and the private high schools. And we need you to come up with some students in your knowledge and say, try out for the speech contest because we've got a $200 gift uh, prize to give away to the one that wins it. And it's a very easy topic. So we just get out there and and uh, solicit people to be in the speech contest and they can contact me and uh, I'll put that up in the chat uh, and go about and get somebody to um, do better than I'm doing right now. Give a good speech, that's it, thanks. So Tim, is the high school speech contest open to any high school student in Monroe County? At any high school student, that's correct, in Monroe County. Okay, and cash prize, $200. Not to mention that great little resume um, builder that winning the right. Blooming Rotary Beach Contest might, might bring to you. And they might win the district contest as well. So, That's okay. right. So Rotarians, go out and spread the word about the speech contest. We're really grateful to Tim for taking on the chairmanship of it this year. Now we just need some participants. Okay. Our next announcement is by Tina Swanson and Chris Michael Morrison, who are members of our community service club committee, community service committee. There's Chris Michael. Hello. And Tina. Mm -hmm. um, what we have coming up in February is a project with the Hoosier Hills Food Bank. Uh, we're going to be sending out a sign up genius we're hoping to man two, um, two sessions on February 23rd. It's a Wednesday uh, where we'll help package okay. cereal uh, to be sent out to other members that um, they send their goods out to. Um, and so there'll be an email coming out and there might be a slide here uh, before the end of what I'm talking about. But it's open. Um, we're going to have 10 to 12 people each session. Um, the sessions will be four o'clock in the afternoon to 5.30 and then a 5.30 to seven o'clock. And um, Rotarians and their families, um, I think also um, if you know somebody, a, a friend that wants to come along, um, they said that that would be fine. Uh, family members need to be 11 years of age and older though. So um, we'll be um, looking for lots of volunteers to help uh, with that project. Yeah, and one last thing, we just uh, placed uh, the sign up link in the, in the Zoom chat line. So check that out. Um, of course, that'll be referenced in our roundabout. Back to you, President Sally. Thank you so much to both of you for taking on the leadership for our, what I believe is pretty much an annual commitment to help out one day of the year with the Hoosier Hills Food Bank. It's fun. 
Um, it's meaningful, it's important work. So please do sign up if you can. I'm so happy that we're able to continue our community service work locally, despite the ongoing pandemic. So finally, I have um, an announcement. Um, we have a new leadership volunteer opportunity for one or two club members that I'd like to share. I am recruiting one or two people to join the steering committee for the annual Rotary Toast. This is of course the annual fundraiser that we take on in collaboration with the other two Bloomington Rotary Clubs. Um, this year's toast will take place like all the other ones on the first Friday of November. So there are one or two slots for, for our club to join the steering committee. I want to thank uh, from the depths of my heart, Sarah Laughlin, who has been a member of this committee since I suspect the very beginning, um, many years of service and leadership, but Sarah stepping down this year as all volunteers should step down at some point. So the current representatives from our club are Alain Barker, Jim Bright, Natalie Blaze, and myself. I don't think I've missed anyone. Um, the steering committee currently meets over Zoom and starting this month, uh, we took a break after the toast last November. Um, committee mem members have important jobs, of course. We determine the recipient. That's the first thing that we'll do in February. And we also plan the event. So in addition to the monthly steering committee meetings, you'll need to serve on one subcommittee. This is a great way to work with Rotarians from the other two Bloomington clubs. And of course, it's an important committee that brings people to the toast itself and brings dollars to our club. And of course, it raises the visibility of Rotary in Bloomington. I don't know how we're going to top the Bloomington Rotary toast from last November with Charlotte Zitlow um, receiving the, the award, but we'll try. So Please let me know if you're interested in serving on this committee. The first meeting is, I believe, the last week of February. Uh, yeah, the last week of February. We'll meet for about an hour um, at 5.30 on a weeknight. So that's my announcement for the day. Um, what time is it? Do we have time? Oh, we have time for Teachers Warehouse Happy Dollars. Is anybody happy this week for any other reason than it's Lunar U New Year or Groundhog's Day? Yes, yes. Charlotte, are you happy? I am, I'm happy and I'm, I will donate, um, let's see, what is it, $20, $20 <clears throat> to celebrate the victory of, of, of Rafael Nadal in the, in the Australian Open. And I stayed up every night last week <laughs> to watch the live, in, including till nine o'clock on Sunday morning, he, which he, 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 he's a master of courage and persistence and skill. And I think he, he exemplifies the rotary. I'm not sure this is service before self, but he certainly serves the world to make them happy, at least me. I've never <laughs> seen anybody happier to win a five set really, really, really hard fought after all, all this week and after he had COVID and after he had foot, foot surgery and didn't play for six months. He came out and won. And so that's something to be happy and to be celebrated, I think. Okay. Thank you for sharing your happiness, Charlotte. Yeah. Raj, how are you happy? Well, I tell you, listening to Charlotte brought a smile to my face. There are two occasions I saw Charlotte so happy. One of them at the toast. And certainly this is not far away from that. I get $5 for the teacher warehouse. Thank you, Raj. Thank you, Raj. Who else? And Bright. I'd like to give $10 to Teachers Warehouse because it's a wonderful organization, but also because uh, in sort of to commemorate the city and Switchyard Park, Jim and I had a five-year-old, a four-year-old and a two-year-old spend the day with us Sunday. And I have a few stuffed animals like the tiger uh, and a snake and a bear, but that wasn't enough. So we took the kids to Switchyard Park and they, Loved it. So $10 to Teachers Warehouse on behalf of the city and Switchyard Park. Awesome. Martha Foster. 
Yes, I would like to put in 18 happy dollars for two nine-year anniversaries for Aaron and me. And also thank you so much for acknowledging that I was in Rotary in the Chicago area and we'll met uh, before Aaron was, I brought Aaron to Rotary. So yes, few people is. know that, huh? <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Martha. Who else? Dave Meyer, welcome back from your travels. Hi, I'd like to put in $4 one for each year of life of a young Afghan uh, child that is uh, being supported, uh, part of our, uh, the family being, Afghan family being supported by the church I belong to. Uh, the reason I single him out is because uh, last week, a member of the community stepped up in the spirit of Rotary. I don't think the person is a Rotarian, but certainly the Rotary spirit and volunteer to take him into their uh, into her small daycare uh, on scholarship, quote unquote, at no cost in order to be able to help this Afghan family so that now this four-year-old can start to learn English and be socialized with little four-year-old and five-year-old peers in the community. So I wanted to say, I'm happy. Very good, that's nice. Wonderful, you're doing great work with the Afghans, Dave. And I read recently that Almost every Afghan refugee is now out of um, where yeah, the Afghan Afghan bad or bad. kind of amazing. Any other happiness to be shared? Ruth Boshkoff, unmute yourself. Sometimes easier said than done. Mute. Am I muted now? You are not muted. That is good. Okay. Um, I want to put um, $10 in um, uh, to thank um, the um, program, the, the um, um, lunch program that um, allowed me to make a new friend in Rotary of Liz Feidel. Oh. We had such a great lunch together and I think that program is great. Lunch buddies, I agree. And this is, now's the time to reach out to your lunch buddy, Beth Savage, I'm reaching out to you officially, um, to schedule your lunch, whether that's gonna be virtual or it doesn't have to be lunch, it could be tea, breakfast, whatever. Um, it's, I, I remember distinctly all of the lunch buddy meetings that I've had, getting to know a fellow Rotarian better, been really great. It was fun. Good. <clears throat> okay, then, if we have no more happy dollars for this week, um, I would like to turn things over to Connie Shakalis to introduce this week's speaker. Thank you, President Sally. His first name means spear in German. I met Gerhard Glom last year because someone told me he had written a surprise play for his large IU lecture class. I went to watch and boy, were those kids surprised. Chatter stopped, so did game playing on laptops. Gerhard had gathered some fine local actors to put on his play about economics and his students were watching with verve. Okay, now see, the following is why I love economics. When I asked Gerhard for his bio so I could introduce him today, he said, I don't like to say much about myself for introductions. Economics, how we use our limited resources. Well, he's not going to eat up his 22 minutes with us by boasting. Professor, good afternoon. We await your insights. Fellow Rotarians, I give you Professor Gerhard Spear Glom. Thanks for having me. So um, I had uh, prepared some slides and I think one of you has agreed to put, uh, to run the slide. So for me, since I'm an old man and multitasking is becoming more and more difficult for me. So uh, when Connie asked me to give this talk, I said, well, what should I talk about? She said, well, you, de you decide. So um, I said, well, We'll talk about life and death. 
And you can all read this quote uh, at the bottom of that first slide by Partha Desgupta, who is one of the great economists uh, who for years has been at places like Harvard and Cambridge. And I guess I'll let you read this all by yourself um, while uh, we get started. And um, so we're going to talk a little bit about A, some economics. We're going to use some numbers. That's going to be unavoidable. Uh, we're going to use a little bit of theory. That's also going to be unavoidable. Um, and then um, I guess we'll talk a little bit about my approach to how I teach or how I like to think about economics and how we convey things. So if you can go to the next slide, this, so as part of this group has said, uh, economics is basically about all of our lives from the moment we're born, uh, all through our lives to the moment we die. And I just noticed a, um, a typo on that, on that slide. So uh, I'm gonna talk, tell a story about my best friend from graduate school, which I think was a good school, but this should be grad school. So he had twins. Uh, he and his wife had twins, babies. Each one of them weighed less than two pounds uh, at birth. So one of the things you might want to do is take your hand, hold out your palm, just like that. And then imagine that each one of his children at birth fit in the palm of his hand. Uh, in basically a year, he had run through a million dollars worth of medical expenditures. So where does economics come in? Well, economics comes in from the very, very beginning. Uh, for some parents, there's going to be a question of insurance coverage. Can I cover this myself? And when you look around, uh, you can look at many insurance plans that we have. And many insurance plans are really not designed well to cover us in cases that we're unprepared to cover ourselves. Some insurance plans cover us for things that are routine, that are really not uh, uh, adverse random outcomes. Uh, and then some insurance plans don't cover us for the things that might be hard to cover by ourselves. For example, my dental insurance at, at IU pays for twice annual teeth cleaning, 100%. Uh, none of that is random. I go every year, uh, twice a year. And these are things that I could cover myself. But if I were to fall off a bicycle and were to break five of my front teeth, that expenditure is only covered to about 50%. So from the very, very moment we're born, the economic problem is going to hit us in the face. Um, and then for some people, it, uh, the economic problem is going to hit us uh, much, much harder as we go through life. So if you go through the next slide, and I'm not sure if these are numbers that most of us know. So this is based on some work that was done by Ian Case and uh, Angus Deaton. And they actually have a lovely book written on this big problem here. So if you think of economic growth and economic development, a typical case would be a typical pattern in the data would be that as a country gets richer, as a country develops on average, if GDP grows, mortality rates would fall. And this is what you see for Sweden, Australia, Canada, the UK, Germany, France. And then there's this red line, that's the US. And those are white males. So uh, if you go back to 1990, mortality rates in the US are kind of in the ballpark relative to, the other, to these other countries, they're dropping uh, in some places a little bit faster than others in some years a little bit faster than others. But then right around the year 1995, mortality rates for white males in this country uh, start to rise. And they rise fast. So in 1990, mortality rates in this country were roughly in the ballpark compared to other 
uh, OECD or rich countries, not so much in the year 2010, 2015, and certainly not now. And then if you ask yourself, what are the causes of these deaths? There are a few that stand out. Number one, suicides. The blue line has risen drastically over the last 20 years. Chronic liver disease uh, has risen drastically. And then there's things called, this thing called poisonings. Sometimes this is referred to accidental poisonings, which I think is a terrible euphemism for drug overdoses. And I think if you look at the latest numbers from last year, uh, last year, I think 90,000 Americans died of drug overdoses. So this is really the, at the heart of economics. And when I teach in my principal's classes, these are the kinds of things the students see. And I wish every American would see these numbers. Uh, I suspect many of us don't know these numbers. So when you see these numbers, it's like, what on earth can we do about these kinds of things? So if you can go to the next slide. Um, I guess, first of all, before we talk about what can we do about these things, um, there is certainly a connection to these, of these numbers to what's going on in the labor markets and uh, what's going on in international trade. So there's a very, very famous paper by three fellows, Otor, Dorn, and Hansen. It's actually, I think, called the China Syndrome paper. And these guys show, and it's a uh, very, very careful analysis that Chinese imports in, into this country, which grew tremendously after 1990, basically destroyed one and a half million manufacturing jobs in that particular period. And uh, you can convince yourself that this is actually a pretty large number because, uh, so ballpark numbers, American labor force is about 150 million people. About 10% uh, percent of those, perhaps less now, is in manufacturing. So this is a really, really large hit on manufacturing jobs. Uh, and by the way, this does not have to happen like that. Um, there's a similar paper done for Germany. So Germany has been exposed to Chinese imports uh, to a relatively large degree too. And the authors there do not find such large drops, such large destruction of manufacturing jobs due to Chinese imports in, in Germany. Uh, but in the United States, these losses are large. So then there's a paper by Pearson Schott, uh, which came out very, very recently. So what you can do is you take all, say, the US counties, and sometimes uh, economists use this concept called a commuting zone. So uh, Martinsville would be in a different county from Indy, but it's going to be in the same commuting zone. And then by county or by commuting zone, you can look at what is the extent of their trade exposure, mostly to being exposed to imports from China. You can rank these from the bottom percentiles to the top percentiles. So it turns out that in that comparison, if you go from the 25 percentile of trade exposure to Chinese imports to the 75 percent uh, percentile of trade exposure, mortality from drug overdoses goes up by about two and a half out of 100,000, which is huge because the base case is about five of 100,000. So some people, there's this mantra that trade is good, trade is good, trade is good. The question, whenever I tell my students, when people say your trade is good, trade is good, or trade is bad, they always, the question is always, good for whom? Um, and if overdose uh, deaths go up, we clearly have a part of the population for whom trade is no good. Uh, there's another paper that attributes by 10% of the increase in OxyContin uh, to trade exposures. And then you can actually study how uh, exposure to and usage of OxyContin influences the labor force. Uh, again, so there's these feedback, feedback, feedback effects uh, that are all, all sizable. So that's certainly not the only cause of the uh, opioid epidemic, but it's certainly a part of it. So then we might want to think about, okay, what can we do? So let's go to the next slide. Uh -oh. 
So just a little bit of economic theory. So this is the kind of stuff one could do in a principles class. So and this is actually based in a paper by, by Casey Mulligan from Chicago. So this downward sloping curve, that's going to be a demand curve. That's kind of like the bread and butter uh, of microeconomics. So what on earth is the demand curve? The demand curve is simply the marginal benefit uh, a consumer would get from a particular good. So what demand are we talking about here? So the demand we're talking about here is the demand for a high. And I'm going to look at one particular product that generates that high. So in this case, I'm going to look at OxyContin. So this the downward sloping curve is the marginal benefit curve. That's the benefit you get from a high from OxyContin. And then there's this flat curve called marginal cost. Well, this is what you would pay for one pill. The marginal cost. What does it cost you to obtain that high? So one of the things we did a few years ago, we reformulated OxyContin to make it harder to abuse OxyContin. So how would an economist capture that? Well, if you make something harder, the cost of that particular activity goes up. And also the marginal cost is gonna go from MC to MC prime. Well, if you're doing that, you're gonna decrease the welfare to the particular consumer. So you can actually capture or calculate in this particular example, the welfare that a consumer would get out of the high. With the low marginal cost, that's gonna be the area of the triangle ABC. And once we've reformulated the OxyContin to make it harder to use, marginal cost goes up to MC prime and the welfare to that particular consumer goes to the area A prime, B prime, C. And you would say, gee, if you look at B and B prime, uh, that particular consumer would consume less OxyContin uh, there's like less drug abuse. If there's less drug abuse, there's a smaller risk uh, from dying from an overdose. And that would only be part of the story because we all know that there are lots and lots of drugs out there. Um, there's heroin, there's fentanyl, and there's a whole bunch of other things you can get, right? So it happens that one of the things that, that, that could happen is if you reformulate OxyContin, and decrease the welfare from on OxyContin, people might actually shift to heroin because the welfare that they get from OxyContin now has decreased. And since it has decreased so much, it might actually overcome the fixed cost that I have to consider if I'm using heroin rather than OxyContin. Why are there fixed costs from using heroin rather than OxyContin? Well, OxyContin is kind of legal, uh, you can get prescription, heroin is not. So the fixed cost capture all the things you have to do to avoid being caught if you use something that's totally legal. So the well-meaning policy of reformulating OxyContin actually decreased the welfare from OxyContin, which was the benefit. But then the unintended consequences was people would shift from OxyContin to heroin. And this is exactly what happened. And then one of the risks of that is if you shift completely to a market that's totally illegal, there's not gonna be any quality control. Often heroin and other things are laced with fentanyl. So the adverse selection problem would kick in. Kick in. So after people shifted from OxyContin to heroin mortality, the theory here would predict that mortality would increase. And this is exactly what happened. This is well documented in the data. So this is one of the examples of perhaps a policy that is well-intended went completely awry. Now, when you think about this, this is how an economist typically would cover uh, the opioid epidemic and think about one particular policy. Now, there's a little bit of a straitjacket because 90,000 Americans died last year of an overdose. In none of the textbooks that we see, in none of the academic papers we see, there's any mention of the grief of the mom or the sister or the brother if a family member dies of an overdose. 
So if you're looking at economics textbooks, you're not going to see terms, or if you look at an index of um, economics textbooks, you're not going to see in the index words like grief and fear and anxiety. And then when you go back to the very, very beginning of the code by Partha Gupta, well, grief and fear and anxiety and absolute terror, for some of us, are part of life. Uh, and it might hit us at various points of our life. And something like this also happens when you go to more positive events in our life. So if you could go to the next slide. So Stevenson and Wolfers are two economists who have written extensively on economics of the family. And you might think that romance, love, finding a partner for mate or just for a few weeks or months are one of the happiest moments in our lives and they give us joy, happiness, and ecstasy. So uh, Stevenson and Wolfers wrote this paper on the economics of the family. So I'm gonna read it to you. To remain relevant to the 21st century, the economics of the family will need to push beyond the production of own children and traditional notions of specialization and seek to uncover the forces that yield the modern family form. This may mean reconceiving the notion of household production, or as we argue, extending models of the family beyond the notion of a household-based firm and toward emphasizing motivations such as consumption complementarities and insurance as central to marriage. So I was just watching a Harry Potter movie the other day. And in one of the contexts, somebody in the Harry Potter movies accused somebody else of having the emotional range of a teaspoon. And I think this uh, excerpt from Stephen and Wolferson uh, displays about the same emotional range um, of a teaspoon. And when I think about how we could teach, we can teach endlessly about demand and supply. And when I go talk to high school students and I ask them, what words come to your mind when you hear economics? I usually get answers that are bimodal. So one answer, one set of answers is typically things like finance, the stock market, Wall Street, GDP. And the other answer is supply and demand and math and graphs. Now, demand and graphs are useful. Equations are useful. But I suspect that if that's what we teach, then that's how we teach the students will forget just about everything we teach like 20 minutes after the final exam. So I'm trying to, to find a language um, that is more appealing. So if you could go to the next slide. So if you think about your life, some of these words that are hidden in, they're written in these bubbles probably show up, have shown up in your life. Commitment, joy, love, exhaustion, anguish, family, sex. Uh, I forgot one, tragedy. So I looked at a leading textbook recently in the index for any of these words, and I couldn't find them. So I, I think the, the textbook treatment of economic issues that really are touching our lives and our deaths are unappealing because the textbooks have the emotional breadth of a teaspoon. And the students are not going to deal, they're not going to be able or willing to confront economics, the very, very powerful tool of economics, unless we develop a, a broader emotional perspective on some of these issues. And unless we allow language to deal with these issues, that is much, much richer. So I think I have like a minute and a half or something like that. So uh, we can go to the next slide. And perhaps we can ask Sarah Laughlin to read this lovely little sonnet. Uh, so one of the classes I'm teaching uh, as part of intensive freshman seminar uh, is a class on the economics of epidemics. So Sarah, would you mind reading that sonnet for us, please? With troubled times and plague across the lands, those of African descent have many needs. 
This crisis has left them with more demands, but what could be the reason for their pleads? Already lacking access to healthcare, the infected increase within the hive, making essential work more of a dare and with a forced hand must now risk their lives. Band-Aids shan't heal an open bloody gash, expand Medicaid to block COVID's sword to protect not just the virus's lash, but improve access so all can afford. A lack of health care may bury them deep. Only through progress shall benefits reap. Thank you. And then Alan Barker, we have one more poem on the next slide. Would you mind reading that one? Sure thing. Uh, environmental movements in your hand. The future we will know up in the air. Now is the time to make them understand. The earth provides so much, we must be fair. Cotton, truly the fabric of our life. Still, with its waste and chemicals beware, at times impacts like the stab from a knife, but pros of new cotton we need to share. See, an alternative has now been found. It is what the consumers must demand. Pros of organic cotton are profound. It can be used by each and every brand. T-shirts, jeans, all the clothes we wear, it's there. Let's come together, show the world we care. Thank you. So the, the, uh, in most of my classes, the students have to do a research project. Uh, in the first stage of the research project is typically I want the full-blown report, and that might be 2,000 words or something like that. The second stage is they have to take that report and they have to cut it in half, so they have to concentrate on the essence. And then the last stage of uh, their research project is I'm, I tell them whatever you've learned in your research report, I want you to write this up in the form of a Shakespearean sonnet. <laughs> Two reasons. One, in a Shakespearean sonnet, every word, every syllable, every phrase has to fit. And then, then I tell them that if they write a research paper that's out of five pages or 2,000 words or whatever, the same is true. Every paragraph has to be in the right place. Every sentence within a paragraph has to be in the right place. And every word in a sentence has to be in the right place. And the other thing that allows us to, uh, to do is use, allows, it allows the students to use language that goes beyond uh, shifts of demand and shifts of supply. So it kind of uh, relaxes that straight jacket uh, that we have in the language that comes from our scientific papers. Uh, in the textbooks. So um, the first uh, poem was from the uh, class on economics of epidemics. And the second poem is uh, from, a, these are all written by students, um, from a class I teach on um, microeconomics for the apparel merchandising student. And their research project was about the use of organic versus non-organic cotton. Uh, in the play that, that Connie mentioned is an attempt to get beyond that straight jacket too. Uh, if you write a play, you have much more freedom to use language much more liberally than if you write an economics textbook. And the point is, uh, or the attempt is, what can I do to reach the students to talk about these all important problems of say 90,000 Americans dying uh, in a year out of a drug overdose? and mortality rates rising. So um, that's all I have to say for now. Thanks for your attention. And I'm gonna to try to answer a few questions. Everhart, thank you so very much. Um, if you have a question, you can unmute yourself and um, speak up. You can also use the prompt in the video screen that shows you holding your hand up. I love the idea of making people distill their research into a sonnet. I mean, what do you say about cross-discipline uh, kinds of things? Have you ever distilled your research into a sonnet? <laughs> I, not my research, but years ago, we had a uh, foreign exchange student and we took him and another foreign exchange student to the outlet mall in Edinburgh or wherever that was. And 
while I was waiting, I not to I, I don't view shopping as a, a hobby. Uh, while I was waiting for these young people to to be done, I wrote a uh, poem of some sorts um, about outlet malls. Um, but they, the the so I haven't haven't done that with my research. But the play that I wrote literally took a few published papers or unpublished papers and tried to find a way to get the point of these papers across to first year IU students. Connie. Gerhard. <coughs> Wonderful speech, you know, I love economics. This is just such a, a, a cool topic. I'm wondering, what were some of the remarks from your students about the play? Well, I think some of them, so they, the play was called Markets on Trial. Uh, so it was a courtroom drama, so to speak. Um, and so the class, the students in the class were mostly Kelly students. Um, I think students who go into the School of Business have a predisposition that markets are good, markets are good, markets are good, uh, markets are better, uh, markets have no faults. Uh, and I think quite a few students told me that um, some of the cases that we brought up reminded them that perhaps that ain't so. Charlotte, you had your hand up? Yes, I have my hand up. My husband taught English literature, especially poetry, and he loved it. And he, 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 it was his, his position that you could express re serious reality better in literature than in science sometimes. And I would guess that that's what you're saying too, in a way, because you can bring things, you synthesize things into meaningful, globs, I guess. And I think that what you're doing is really remarkable. Well, I'm trying. So this is actually a relatively same, recent uh, yeah, uh, initiative. Uh, I didn't think like this 10 years ago, uh, yeah. perhaps even five years ago. Um, if I can but, add something. Yeah, when, sure. When, the university is downplaying arts and sciences in favor of business school. Now, you, you know that. The business school and the Neil O'Neill school are being emphasized and then arts and sciences are being downplayed. Is that to our detriment? I guess my, my thought thinking is yes, but what is your thinking? That's a really, really hard question. Um, so I wonder, and I, I so, one of the things I tried to get in across in the classroom is um, I want the students to think for their own. So one of the first things I tell them, when, literally first day of class, one of the things I tell them is don't believe anything I say. And I want them to make up their own mind. Um, I don't know what's going on and many of the other classrooms in different schools on this campus. Um, I think one of the things that the College of Arts and Sciences prides itself is uh, foster some initiatives to think critically and question everything. Um, I do have a hunch. I have not seen a careful study. I mean, there used to be studies to be this, this country have too many lawyers. Um, I have not seen uh, a study that asks, do we have too many young people going into finance? Um, and I think that would be a hard thing to do. Uh, but I think it's very, very valuable. Uh, to help young people to make up their own minds on 
just about everything that can potentially confront them in their lives. So there's a question about uh, IFS in the chat. Uh, IFS stands for Intensive Freshman Seminar. It's one of IU's best kept secrets, actually. Uh, intensive Freshman Seminar is a chance to take a uh, three credit course in two and a half weeks before the students start the, their first fall semester. Um, it's very intensive. We teach three class, three hours of class a day from Monday through uh, Friday, and then often there are activities in the afternoon. So um, it's actually it's really really difficult to do that because we get two and a half weeks for material that usually covers 14, 15, that we usually take 14, 15 weeks for. Um, so one of the things I try to do is I give the students a book to read before they get here. Uh, so they have some basis before they actually get to the campus. So usually they come on like August 1st or 2nd. And then those classes are done August 18th or 19th or something like that. Um, we have them write papers, we have them do debates in class. One of the things, one of the nice things I uh, started to do recently, and I'm now teaching that epidemics class with Rich Hardy from the biology department. So we give them debate topics uh, to prepare for. Uh, so one, one debate topic uh, last year was, if there is a large institution that through whatever activities causes the spread of COVID into the community, should the state government hold that large institution responsible financially for the spread of COVID into the community? So this could be uh, nursing homes, this could be meatpacking plants, this could be prisons, this could be I don't know, IU football games, that was the question, um, and we didn't tell the students um, what side of the debate they were going to be on. They only found that out the morning of the debate. So we mm -hmm. pulled out two teams, say, okay, you, here's your topic. You flip a coin, you get the con side, you get the pro side. So that's one of the activities we do. Um, one of the things we're trying to do this year, this August in IFS is, um, we're trying to write a white paper for the state of Indiana to prepare, to better prepare for uh, similar epidemics that might strike in the future. Hmm. Well, thank you so much, uh, Gerhard, for joining us today. Um, wonderful talk, everything from life to death, information about your profession and the, the, uh, power of teaching undergraduates. Um, very much appreciate it. In um, recognition of your program today, we will be making a um, donation to Cardinal Stage, one of our local organizations that's been badly hit by the pandemic. Um, thank you. Please well, join thanks us. Thanks for having me. Yeah, So absolutely. Connie has my email uh, contact information if any of you have any other uh, questions, any more questions. Wonderful. I'll try my best to answer them, but thanks for having me. Thank you. Alain Barker, would you introduce next week's program? Absolutely. Uh, so next week, uh, back on Zoom, our speakers are Tamara Lowenthal and Jim Campbell from the Lotus Education and Arts uh, uh, Foundation. Their, their topic will be growing global citizens through educational outreach. So that should be a lot of fun as well and a direct relationship with our big community project and our district grant uh, taking place later this spring. Okay, Michael or Natalie, could you please share the four-way test graphic? And we'll close our meeting by reciting the four-way test plus one. You may unmute. Of the things we think they do, first, 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 Third, third, third,
Four. 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 There's Joy Harder in the screen. Okay. Thank you all Rotarians. Thank <laughs> you. Um, um, we'll see you all next week. Have a great week. Bye everybody. Bye everybody. Bye.